All right, guys. So, uh, so we might get this panel started, and um, I'm going to just um, introduce our panelists very quickly. So, first of all, we have the very lovely Jason Lord, Californian coordinator, <laughs> defining root causes. Thank you. We also had Richard Osmondson from the Money Free Party in New Zealand. Yeah. And uh, we had Michael's presentation, the transition of the transition of zero price. Oh God, sorry, price of zero transitions. I, uh, the, you know, good enough. This one. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Oh, God, I'm sorry. Um, then we also had Ziggy with the RBT, RBE 10K project. And we've got Rich, who didn't present today, but he's joining us once again because I think, um, I think he was popular. So, um, Rich... <laughs> and, of course, the incredible and inspiring Eleanor Goldfield joining us on the end about the fight and the build. All right, guys, so do we have any questions that people would like to ask? If you do, please join us down the side. So we're going to do it the same way we did PJ's Q&A. And um, I invite you now to come down to the side here and ask your questions. So just line up on the side and, uh, and we'll start off. Sorry? Uh, we could. All right, if someone wants to organize that. Okay, first question. Have we only got one person who wants to ask all these incredible people a question? Don't be afraid, guys. If you do have something, try and formulate something. That's the way, yeah. Woo! All right. So just come down the side and line up. We would like to do it, you know, in a really relaxed format sitting there, but, you know, if we want to put it out to our online audience, we're kind of restricted with the audio, as I was saying before. So, okay. So first question. Yeah, so I have a question for Richard. Um, so I, I really like your presentation and the idea that you put. And uh, so I will formulate my question. I'm from Switzerland, and uh, which is a country that, in terms of population and size, seems to be close to New Zealand. And last year, we had the opportunity, every, cit every citizen, to vote on the universal basic income, which have been uh, massively refused by the population. Even by the young people, I'm on my early 20s, and like I've seen many of my friends against it. And so um, you said that when we are proposing people uh, a better system or better ID, uh, why would they refuse? But I have an example here that they did, and on something that seems to be one step lower than the RBE. So my question is, why do you think that uh, New Zealand is the mind of people in New Zealand is more ready, and haven't you considered maybe the idea uh, of introduce, implement the UBI? Right. Okay. Thank you very much, good question. Yeah, UBI, which we haven't really talked about. First answer is UBI. Colin Turner in Spain, author of, uh, founder of the Free World Charter, t terms it universal basic serfdom. It's just prolonging the capitalistic agony, give people special tokens, and once again, they can go out and buy, you know, cheap jewellery and drugs and shoes. I mean, you know, you can imagine the landlords and the brewers and the gambling companies rubbing their hands with glee when the poor people get some money. It doesn't change anything at all. So I would say that hopefully is why the and Swiss people are generally very sensible, the ones I've known, that's why they rejected it. Because it's pointless, it's just prolonging the agony, really. Is that enough of an answer? Uh, well, I... I have seen more that they were scared of change, or maybe they didn't. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, they they did. They were not enough informed that maybe the system should be changed or anything. So, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, also the I think the mentality of New Zealand is very different to the mentality of any European countries as well. Actually, you know, we're very independent, uh, very far from anywhere, and uh, a more idealistic nature. Actually, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to speak to your question. Sorry, I'm just doing an organizational thing just very quickly. Could I get you guys to shuffle on down? And also, I want to introduce another one of our guests who just showed up, <laughs> Richard Michelle, systems and ethics designer. He was doing a hour and a half workshop uh, next door. And, um, you know, I'd like you to invite Richard as part of the panel as well. <laughs> now, we have three Richards 
on the panel. Yeah, I was going to say, because that's not going to be confusing at all. <laughs> well, I know Rich goes by Rich, yeah. so he doesn't need to be Richard, but we do have two Richards here, so I guess you'll just have to say their f with your full name. So Richard Moshel or Richard M. And then we have Richard Osmerson, Richard O, I don't know. Is that all right? We'll, go, we'll do it like that? All right, so we've got a seat there ready for Peter Joseph when, when he shows up. All right, guys, so who, who wants to like still to speak? I'd like to say something about UBI. Yeah, yeah, I'm just handing um, it down. All right. I'd like to say something about UBI. Um, the notion of deserving is very ingrained in our culture. And deserving both reward and punishment and the Zygis movement and, and the resource-based economy is, is not deserving based um, policy. And I, I reckon most people reject the UBI because they consider people who do not deserve money shouldn't get it. And, and it's, it's very difficult for people who have such an ingrained notion of deserving both uh, uh, and, and, and this includes punishment, um, uh, be given some money. It, it, feels, it feels wrong for a lot of people. So it's not just a practical thing that it doesn't achieve anything. It's just an, it's an emotional thing. You don't deserve that money because you didn't work for it. And uh, I guess uh, from my perspective, I've talked about a few alternative economic systems like true cost economics and uh, steady state economics. I didn't mention a UBI, and I'd consider that before true cost economics, as to me it didn't actually uh, fix any of the root causes that uh, Jason was talking about. To me, the UBI is a way of ensuring that the, the current, current monetary system doesn't collapse because of things like technological unemployment, but it doesn't cause any major, um, it, it doesn't fix any of the core problems with you know, the environment and, and those sorts of things. Yeah, um, so I just want to chime in on this a little bit because um, in response to what Richard said, so we're going to have Battle of the Richards here. Um, so there's actually a study conducted in Canada from Dauphin, Manitoba, uh, the study um, author's name is Dr. Elizabeth Forget. Yes, that is her last name. And uh, what it found actually was that when uh, universal basic income was implemented in Dauphin from 1974 to 1979, um, many social conditions improved quite a bit. Um, in addition to the fact that there was only a very minor drop in employment, uh, mostly accounted for by new mothers who just stayed home longer, um, and uh, kids who stayed in school longer. Um, the, there was a significant drop in heart disease, a significant drop in uh, mental illness, significant drop in crime. So uh, I, I agree that a universal basic income is not enough. It's not where we should end our activism. But it is. But it's important to understand. Like I think it's important to look at things from an incrementalist perspective. So what that means is, like you know, you can't just sort of stand on the steps of Parliament or Congress or whatever and say I want an RBE and then like that'll be the end of it. You know, because you have to kind of eke out. Uh, like like Eleanor was saying, you, there has to be a practical application of things, and you have to kind of work towards things on a step by step basis where um, I think that one of the most important things to consider is that there are a lot of people suffering right now who are impoverished, and a universal basic income could help them. Now, that said, there is a caveat I should add, and it's actually something Federico brought up in his TED Talk, so it's a shame he's not here today. He might have been able to offer more information. But um, Feder Federico mentioned the problem of rent. So if, let's just, Hypothetically, your universal basic income is $1,500 a month. What's to stop uh, landlords from just raising all of their prices by $1,500 a month? I don't know. I don't have, know all the kinks of how a universal basic income could work, but I do know that there is sound science to show that there are ways that it can make life better, so we shouldn't completely veto it. Anybody else want to? Yeah. I go. I'm good. Hey, um, Matt at the console, just uh, for helpful to the people up here, if you could get a little bit of the question microphone down here in the floor monitors without squealing us out, that would be awesome. Um, on the UBI concept, uh, 
back in the first Z Day Q and A I did in 2010, I think, um, someone said, "Why don't we just wipe out all the debt to zero? You know, that'll fix everything." And that was a early, to me, a conceptual form of you know, instead of you know giving people some money, let's just wipe out what we owe and we'll start over. And the problem still remains structural. That it, if you were here earlier, I put up a little movie with the cyclical consumption. If the market consumption model is still in place, you still have a disaster on your hands, whether um, uh, you're providing some some relief or not, because that that cyclical cyclical consumption center of the market system is a waste machine, and it we're basically we're you know it's a it's a pollution creator, it's a waste generator, uh, and that is not sustainable. So. We can do things. The other thing with UBI, I'm not familiar with the study Rich mentioned, but it makes sense to me in, this, in the, so far as it doesn't mean it's um, UBI would solve the problem. It might alleviate some pressures temporarily, but you still have the problem of inflation. You know, and then they just said, you know, what's to stop people from raising prices? Um, and the other thing, too, is um, in the United States, unemployment uh, went down uh, in the year, you know, before the bank bailouts. Okay. Crime went down with unemployment. Now, does that mean unemployment causes crime? No, it just means that it's an indicator uh, of criminal tendency pressure within the population. So uh, alleviating the desperation, basically, as far as I'm concerned, UBI is an attempt to address inequality, income inequality. Um, and it may have some short-term um, effects. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's actually going to solve the problem. And also, just keep in mind, as long as that cyclical consumption engine is churning, uh, we, we're just screwing the environment. And the environment doesn't give a shit. It just doesn't. When we, when we pass environmental thresholds, um, you know, we, have serious, we have serious problems. And we're reducing the carrying capacity of the planet. And that needs to be fundamentally in the economic system. Okay? Uh, and it's not. It's not even close to being addressed. Okay, pass the one down to Okay, here's the third dick. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I love the idea of a universal basic income. I, I think it's, it's going to be a real boon for the zeitgeist movement because it will re release so much time for us to, to get together and do stuff intensively. You know, it's really hard to get people out of their jobs and putting some quality time together to be planning and building the RBE. So, to my mind, it would be a terrific boon if we could, you know, make this thing happen and encourage it to happen. Um, but that said, from, you know, I, I agree with all of the other comments and I would add the extra comment that, from, from an ethics point of view, that when you have a kind of a guaranteed basic income scheme, you've got to ask the question, well, who are the guarantors? You know, you can't have a guarantee system without guarantors. And if there are no guarantors, then when the shit hits the fan um, and there's no guarantors, then, you know, everyone is going to suffer. Um, so, to my mind, if you're going to look at it from an ethical point of view, you really have to have a mutual responsibility set up where everyone takes the same responsibility for looking after each other's welfare. But meanwhile, GBI would be great. Next question? All right, let's go. Hi there. Um, so directed at Richard Osmussen, but for everyone. Um, uh, you were talking about, you know, the, the change comes from uh, everyone's uh, mind frame, you know, changing the mindset. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering if you could maybe expand a bit on, uh, like, what is it? Like, like, is it gradual or do we all change our mindset and then decide on one day to switch over? Like, how, how gradual is it? Is it incremental or is it kind of da 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 bam? Yeah, and, like and da, 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 bang, actually, yeah. It's one of the examples I sometimes use in uh, 2009, uh, the island of Western Samoa changed from driving on the right to driving on the left for a whole bunch of good reasons, mostly consumer safety. But they didn't do it when they first thought of the idea. 
you know, don't go yourself tonight because we've got to wait until everyone else understands. And it took a little while and they got together and they had lots of meetings and they produced pamphlets and videos and they made sure that everybody understood. But when they were all ready, then they did it. And I would say that the process of us being here today is us starting to get ready. Because, I mean, just to imagine, just bring the scale right down. Say we were the population of Australia. We're ready, aren't we? We wouldn't even take our money out in the street with us again. We'd just start right now. And all we need to do is scale that up. That's as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, da 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 da, da bang, absolutely, yeah. So I'm just going to sneak in because of your uh, UBI discussion. So I'm just going to add one more thing. Sorry to jump in, but um, there is one theory I've seen, which is uh, that the UBI, we put all our eggs in one basket, and then if the government suddenly decides to change that, then we're all in trouble because we're all relying on that. And there's this other concept that maybe we can put all of our eggs into automation or something like that, so that, that, we, that we own and control the machines that do it. So I was just wondering if maybe you guys could expand on that idea as well, just because this um, subject came up. So. Just going back to the first point, um, I, I like to think of the analogy of a, a herd of buffalo um, or deer. Uh, trying to get across some, some water, and uh, the crocodiles in the water, water. So if we only individually go across, we're all going to get killed off by the crocodiles. But if we go as a large group, then we can, you know, it can be safe. So there are times when you do need to have, you know, at least small groups going over, even if it's not everyone all in one go. Uh, but lots of little, just individual people, it's probably not sustainable. I th sorry, I think um, <clears throat> there is a tendency to confuse government with state. Uh, there are two, these are very, two very distinct entities. So the government uh, makes policy uh, for how the state runs, but whatever is, is owned by the state and, and, and it is implemented, we all own it, and we, we're not giving something for free. Um, if, if we are getting um, free health insurance because the state covers it, it's not that we, we are the recipients of, of, of some welfare that comes from, from the people that work, um, and, and it, it's, it's a gift. <clears throat> it's that we all own it, and, and we decide to share uh, that safety net. And it, it's, it's very important that we understand that the, uh, the state is not the enemy, it's not separate from us. We are the state. Everybody here in this room, we are part of the state. Not the government, maybe, but yes, the state. In terms of the paradigm shift question, uh, I think that it... <laughs> Jason gave me the bad mic on purpose. Uh, I think it's very important that idea of leading by example because I think the discussions of political theory are very important, but a lot of people can't relate to that. Um, and they don't either have the education because they haven't been exposed to it, which is very much the case in a lot of places in the US. Uh, but I think that what we have to do is lead by example. And those that that's that like you know, community garden idea that I was talking about. It's like, just go out and start doing things, and then you can bring people into that and gradually shift the paradigm. Because I don't think, I mean, as, as much as it sounds nice that it'll happen very quickly, each of us came to where we are today by gradual change. And granted, we don't have a lot of time to make quick change, but we do have to start with that community idea of, well, let's just start doing something as opposed to just hypothetically, like, what do you hypothetically think of an RBE? If you ask the average human being that, they're not gonna know what the fuck you're talking about. So it's that like leading by example and going out there and doing it, and then they will start, their paradigm will start shifting outside the confines of a capitalist, consumerist, uh, corrupt society. Uh, the one thing that I wanted to say, and I think you were talking about um, how, like you brought up the universal basic income. Uh, I think it's important to consider it that if we do go that way, that, that that is a temporary way to alleviate the social stresses that are currently in place. It's, we're not suggest, or at least I'm not suggesting that, you know, well, okay, we have a UBI now and then everything's fixed because everything that you heard about the environment and sustainability is very true. 
as it stands right now. Uh, Peter was actually a little off. He said that it was that we use up our uh, resources about one third of the way through the year. It's actually two thirds, but that's still pretty bad. Uh, we are borrowing from the 2030s in terms of resources because we've been doing this for a long time. So uh, this is all information from the Global Footprint Network, uh, which measures how quickly we use up resources. So absolutely capitalism has to change. As I, I love the way Eleanor put it in her talk today, which was either we kill capitalism or it kills us. But uh, that said, you know, killing capitalism isn't gonna be, I, I, perhaps I don't fully understand where Richard's coming from, but I don't see that something that happens in the course of six months or a year or even five years. I see that as something that happens in the course of a generation. And as a result, because you have a lot of people who are really suffering very badly right now, and I think that if we do go with a universal basic income, you should think of it as a step and not the end goal. I suppose my concern is that, like, say we get given a grand a week, which would be, really good and then a year down the track the government goes sorry we can't afford it 500 bucks a week that's it you're tough luck you know because and all our eggs are in that basket and they have the control of that compared to if we have I don't know shares in robots then we own a bunch of robots and and, and which which means that we're like we're always sort of covered like how do we cover ourselves that this larger group can't manipulate that well, in some way you know because we're, we're putting all of our focus into one thing well, the, so that's, so, that's my question, yeah. So the, um, okay, so here's the thing about that. It's a good question, but if you should stop for a moment and think and realize that it's kind of applicable um, to any kind of public policy or social safety net. I mean, governments have been clawing back social safety nets for like 30 years. It started in the Reagan era. Just now, just the other day, uh, America just narrowly avoided losing what small amount of public health care they managed to claw out with uh, with Obama or sorry with the, the Affordable Care Act and um, you know yeah you're right we could in any in any situation the government could decide or legislate away um, the you know whatever benefits it chooses to give society, but that's not that's not endemic to a universal basic income. That's endemic to any social policy, and so it becomes necessary. I mean, one of the reasons that uh, Trump Care failed um, was because people at a grassroots level uh, lobbied their own uh, Congress people, you know, kind of mercilessly. So it's important that we as activists we have to. Under uh, Chris Hedges said it perfectly. Our job is not to elect the right people. Our job is to make sure that whoever we do elect is afraid enough of us that they don't screw us over. So, you know, uh, yes, that, that is a problem and it is something that could very well become an issue, but, it, but with an active citizenry, you can prevent the government from basically taking away a social safety net. It's just a matter of constant diligence. Sam, I would say what you're doing is identifying yet another problem in anything this side of transition. There's no way around it. UBI, multi-shared robots or anything else, it's just flawed because we've still got a money system. There's only one way out and it's the big way out. Yeah, thanks. Good, thanks. So um, my text didn't uh, go through, but I'm gonna do it like this and he is gonna hear it because uh, he's in, uh, here we go. So Peter, I, I was trying to send you a text. It didn't go through because I'm too far underground, so. Hang on. Three. Get your ass <laughs> That's the audience saying get your ass down here. So there's a chair for you right there on the left. <clears throat> All right. Thank you and welcome back. <laughs> You're uh, free to um, manhandle that microphone so you don't have to like hurt your back asking us a question. It, it will t tip up if you uh, motivate it. Yeah, there you go. I just want to prefix all this by saying thank you, Casey and the Brisbane team. You guys done a fantastic job, very thank inclusive. You. Really, really good thank stuff. You. And thank you in particular to Mr. Penny and Mr. Moore. I loved your presentations, guys. So thank you so much. Really diverse, very You can tip it up. Awesome. Okay, so speaking of inclusivity, 
I've always considered myself a very atypical, very unusual member of the zeitgeist. I'm not vegan, I'm not particularly spiritual, not even particularly clever person. And later this year I'll be joining the military. So I probably hold some worldviews, etc., that probably in direct opposition to a lot of the membership of Zeitgeist. Hello. So my question is, how would you convince someone who, like me, probably has a completely contrary and completely opposite view to the views of the general membership and to everyone else in Zeitgeist? How would what, you convince me? What are, you, what are your views on healthy food or clean water or equality or planetary survival? I bet they're the same as every person here. Okay, let me propose it a different way then. How would you convince someone who may even share the same views but they're not presented the question like that? It's, they're not asked, do you appreciate clean water? It's like, you know, do you love America? Or if you don't, the terrorists will win. How would you present the question, or how would you convince me in such a way, or convince someone from the other side of the aisle, as it were? Right. Okay. Um, I'm probably not going to convince you, you know, whether it's through torture or bribery, okay? But um, one of the things I've found over time is that uh, engaging every single person, if I'm going to talk to somebody, you have to find common ground. Okay, and regardless of your political views, your spiritual views, uh, your economic views, actually they're all uh, artificially divisionary. Okay, it makes you think you're separate from you know me, or or maybe if you're a Catholic, you don't subscribe to other religions, and there's a there's a division right there. Are you gonna, or if you're an uh, atheist, you know, are you gonna walk up and say, oh, your belief in God is wrong, and how effective do you think that's going to be in convincing someone? So you have to find common ground. You know, and that, that this is right where he went with you at the get-go, and then it kind of took, it, it circumvented your argument, and you're like, oh, no, so let me, let me say it in another way. It's like, no, it's like you have to find common ground. So it's like you and I are probably more similar than we would imagine ourselves different because without air we die, without the sun we die, without water nutrition, vocation, without being touched as a child you'll die. You know, you have a social component to being a human being. You have an environmental component to being a human being. And these things make everyone universally around the world exactly the same. We all have the same need. So now you're starting at what we, the language I've been adopting from our, my time with the movie is life ground. Okay, you start there. That's where this all starts, at the fundamental life ground where we are all the same. All right. And then uh, the rest of what an RBE may look like is built from there. And so finding that common ground, if, if you meet somebody, it's like you need to first find out where your similarities are, and you can always start at the life ground. All right, whoa, 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 whoa. No, we're well, not He wants yet. you to come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I got a technique for you. I Sorry, call it the guys. short circuit method. So the way I do this is um, when people bring up a certain argument. So there was a man who was here, and I don't know if he's here today, but yet yesterday we were having a conversation outside, and he looks at me and he says, you know, um, if we give people a universal basic income, they're going to become lazy and they're not going to do anything. So I referenced the exact same study that I quoted to you earlier, Dr. Elizabeth Forget, and why that is not the case. Uh, familiarize yourself with, like, they're, they're, okay, so I didn't come to the Zeitgeist movement because I saw Addendum. I loved that movie, but I, you know, I saw it and went, oh my God, you know, I want to be part of that. I came to the Zeitgeist movement because I was doing an enormous amount of research, and I began to realize that all of Peter's conclusions were correct. So now, having done all that research, I know how to debunk pretty much every, you know, 101 level argument that is thrown at me. Like uh, somebody said to me a, a couple of weeks ago, you know, oh, capitalism created all this wealth. No, technology created all this wealth. Here's the data that proves it. Um, so what the short circuit method is, well, ooh, apparently it shorts out the microphone. Um, uh, so um, uh, what, what it is, is you say something that is completely unexpected to them, that come, and you'll know how to do that because basically it's, you know what the standard, you know, uh, capitalist worldview is. So you say something completely contrary to that. Um, so the one I like to use on my grandmother is, um, you know, like, no, she brings it up sometimes. So I'd be like, you know, no, 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 no. I think everybody should have, um, should have, uh, you know, access to, to uh, living essentials, whether they're working or not. And she goes, 
because nobody says that to her. And then I explain to her the train of thought because what that, what that kind of surprised reaction does is it's such a jolt to them that when they, where they go, oh God, I, you know, I just heard something I've never heard before. It takes them out of that, that, you know, that comfortable worldview because they're forced to consider a new opinion. And when they're in that, that moment, you can sort of sit down and lay out all of the, all of the train of thought or, you know, parse it out to whatever degree you think that person can handle it. Um, and just on top of that, as I've said before, I've got an enormous amount of data, enormous amount of research. That's how I put these uh, talks together. Don't hesitate to contact me if you were talking to somebody and you know, you're know you saying, okay, I, I'm having this argument with my coworker. I don't know how to convince him. I can, chances are I will have the study or the you know the analysis or the data that you need and you know I'm happy to share it because I feel that these things should be available to everybody. Um, yes. And just really quick to add to that, I think that sometimes even if you have a really good argument, if you give somebody a factual argument and they're not ready to logically accept it, you're fucked. Um, so I think that that's where art becomes really important. Art has this beautiful way of appealing to people on an emotional level and then rising eventually to the logic base. And that's why you know a lot of what I do, like whether that be music or spoken word or you know visual art, it's very it's a beautiful way of connecting with somebody in a non-confrontational way that is it's like here here's this, you kind of emotionally take it in and stew on it and ruminate on it and let them take it in that way as opposed to like a confrontational argument. So, um, so in my presentation, I uh, gave a, a section about uh, crossing the chasm and uh, it's based on uh, Robert Moore's uh, book. And it, it explains like the, where the early innovators and early adopters of the RBE concept and uh, it could be that you might be uh, considered a pragmatist or a you know, late majority or a laggard when it turns, you know, comes to the adoption of this concept. So um, it might be that we're just not at the point that you think that you're ready to take on that. Um, or it could be that you know, there's a lot of other people that you might be uh, expecting to, to follow first and uh, then you will. You have to make people feel like it's their own conclusion rather than feeling imposed upon. If you can figure out how to do that, they arrive, they arrive at the conclusion themselves. It's a strategy. You kind of twist them and turn them when they realize it. It may take a week, it might take a month, but if you impose and you just lecture people, as I've done and failed, so I know, <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't work as well than trying to make it feel like it's their own conclusion and they re re arrived at it on their own. I, I think dissenting views are really critical, really important. And we need to work out a way how to deal with those views and the people that hold them. <clears throat> I'm very influenced by um, a, philo a German philosopher, Jürgen Habermas, who talks about discourse ethics and so forth. And, I've spent many years looking at all of that and, and of trying to apply it in practice. It seems to me that, that those who have dissenting views really need to come to the party with a view to trying to reach agreement with the intention of reaching agreement as in a conflict resolution. Because if we're to avoid imposing, then, and we agree that you know, agreement is necessary, then we need to be ready to come to the party and, and argue it out until the, the weight of the, of the best reason wins. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to note the importance of um, distinguishing values from um, facts or evidence. So, Whenever you 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 have a conflict in the conversation and you are not getting across uh, with with one with something that you want to point out, and, and you are not developing agreement, um, it's very different the attitude you're going to take if you're talking about values than if you're talking about facts. 
if you're talking about facts, you need evidence, and you need a, a solid, uh, robust uh, a way to, to communicate that evidence. But if you're talking about values, what you're, you, uh, what you're gonna pursue is to find an inconsistency between th the values that this other person hold so that they can, they can, they can see how um, you, you can't be um, at the same time um, selfish and loving, for example. So you have to make that contrast and, and that takes, uh, you have to be very clever. To, to get them to realize, uh, what the hell, I, I, um, I, I didn't think it that way, or perhaps uh, the, the values espoused by the, the person you're talking about are incons completely inconsistent with an RBE, and there's no way you're going to convince this person. So uh, perhaps it's best to aim for the low-hanging fruit. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys, sincerely. Okay, so this one's for you, Ziggy. I love your presentation on the RBE 10K and the um, minimalist resource-based economy, and it does um, really inspire me to want to participate in the movement myself when I'm a little less time poor and I have 10 grand to blow. <laughs> anyway, I have a little question for you about the implementation details of it. I was just wondering, um, you mentioned you wanted it to be sort of a global scale thing, and it sounded as though there was some sort of template, these little micro cities needed it to follow. Is it possible for there to be deviations between these templates? Like say if you had the um, mitosis going on with one of your towns and one area wanted, well one town wanted to specialise in medicine, the other one to specialise in engineering research, would that be possible under your plan or is, that, is uh, there one sort of set template the towns need to follow, no, no, much no. like a franchise? This is, this is why I started the presentation defining the RB10000 project as a meta project. It's a project that uh, includes a template only as a guide or a, as an example of the kind of strategy that you can come up with. If you really love that the, the, the root strategy, you can say, well, I'm going to be based on that, which is the example of the Pretia project. Pretia project considers, well, this, this, this ex example works very well, although <coughs> the Pretia project makes emphasis on the first implementation of the first city as an experimental thing. It has a lifetime of, of two years, and then we'll see what happens. Um, but then if you think, well, maybe we can do, we can do it uh, some, uh, um, in, in, in another way, uh, with fewer people, with a greater budget, in a longer term, um, with, um, you, you, can, you can define uh, the, yeah. the strategy. You can, um, uh, and, and you can fork. This is, this is a very well-known concept in the open source uh, movement where you may like a project, but not entirely, and you don't want to change the project. You say, well, I'm going to grab this project, make my few modifications and fork it, and, and then appeal to other people. Say, well, I have this new proposal that has all these different features, um, which are different, uh, it, the, the main project is still there, but then you have this other alternative. And sometimes uh, two different projects merge back because they, they, they uh, empower each other, and sometimes they maintain their, their very different um, uh, positions. Uh, and this happens, for example, if, if you know anything about Linux, uh, every Linux distro uh, it's 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 just like that. Like Debian and Ubuntu uh, share the same concept, but they forked, and they are very distinct. But 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 they share the same um, the same methodology for a lot of what they do. So if you know very well how to manage one, you will probably be very proficient at the other one as well. Um, so if you are passionate about one of the proposals of uh, of anyone collaborating. Um, you can you can participate in that project, or if you uh, if if you want to bring about something new, and, and refreshing and alternative, you can create your own and then appeal uh, for collaboration. And it's intended to have each project um, um, be used as a, as a uh, as a module that is an interchangeable, so that projects uh, implementation projects can grab this module. 
it, they, they can say, well, I, I like the, the, the yurt um, a proposal and it works with my budget, so I'm going to implement it. And it's not yours, you didn't work on the yurts, but you like it and it works for yours. So you have your strategy and, and you just plug in uh, the yurts for, for, for uh, living. And that, that's, you, you can participate in any way you want. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, oh, hello there. Uh, uh, um, my question goes around, um, I think that Zeitgeist movement is being a tremendous or if not one of the greatest phenomenons of social analysis and goes to the root cause analysis, like root, define the root causes of what's going on in our society. Um, and I'm, I'm in the movement since 2011, coordinator of Brazil. And I have seen through this path um, um, many, uh, our striving, our, our struggling, or, or trying to put like, Zeitgeist is not a conspiracy, because it started with a conspirational movement. And then was after that a communist movement, a technocracy movement, you know, like our, or Peter Joseph was demonized, you know, like as a satanic antichrist or something like that through the time. And it's been really hard and tough through time, put like disassociated, detached like communism or socialism or any other ism from the movement. Uh, the movement, even the zeitgeist defined, there is a quote that defined that, that, that make these distinctions between communism, telling that zeitgeist movement make a scientific analysis, uh, provide a scientific uh, solution. Uh, it doesn't matter, it's not about opinion. It's about how's the best way based on a scientific method and how we can achieve that. Uh, even say that, I'm gonna put the question, sorry. It's a, it's a, uh, even said that Zeitgeist is a no moral movement. What, I'm, what bothers me and I see that can be harmful to the movement, it can destroy the movement from within. It's like as the time passed by, now the Zeitgeist movement is being associated with many other movements. Unsexism, veganism. I would like to tell my friend, you don't have to be vegan to be part of the movement because he make the question here, I'm not vegan. You can have an apple and you can be part of the movement. You know, uh, the movement got a really difficult uh, uh, um, uh, core analysis to be passed forward, and I guess that people bring all these externalities of society, this structural violence that divide people, and using zeitgeist movement as a stage, as a ring to support this idea, make everything much more blurred, much more confused, and people feel like even awkward to say, "I'm not vegan. Can I be part?" So my question is. Um, how can we like make this clear and use the define the root causes of zeitgeist movement to our personal causes? That's amazing causes. I support many of them. I think that they're great, but they still being externality of the, of the society and not the movement itself. Uh, and then this being disrupted not only to pass the message, but among the coordinators in Brazil and in some other places that I have found. People misunderstand, confuse, and make the message of the Zeitgeist movement being associated to many other other causes, and we miss the approach of the the, the real principles of the movement. That's my concern and, that's, and my question. And that's the sad reality of, of any grassroots organization of this nature that has achieved any kind of popularity. You have people twisting and turning to try and find ways to argue against it through symbols, which is what all of those labels are. I think the movement has done a tremendously good job since 2008 upon its conception in its materials to be extremely clear about what it's about. We haven't, we, we've been trolled to shit. I mean, my God, I've spent, I don't even wanna talk about what I've had to go through personally because of, of the insanity of the people that hated this thing so much for whatever reason, whether it was religious reasons or the cult of anti-conspiracy, which is truly a cultish phenomenon out there, especially in America. And of course, the communist stuff, and and you know that that's just the truth of what we're having to deal with. If it wasn't those things, it would be something else. So I I try to look beyond that and hope that those that do, for example, read the Zeitgeist Movement Defined, will take it at its core content value and make their own decisions. That's you know critical thought is what's required for the type of people that would be involved in the movement anyway. And if they're that subject and that credulous to just believe labels slapped onto it, well, then they're not ready for the movement to begin with. Yeah. Perfect. 
Yeah, um, so to follow up with what Peter was saying, um, all very good points. Uh, this is kind of, sorry, I'm awkward, remember? <laughs> okay, so um, uh, to follow up with what Peter was saying, uh, I brought this up yesterday when I said that it's really important for us to stay on message. And that's because it's so easy that if you are challenging the dominant narrative, then anybody who has any kind of challenge to the dominant narrative will then want to so th associate themselves with you and want to say, so you know, I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten about like chemtrails, the JFK assassination, the moon, flat earth, you know. Um, and I'm not, look, okay, I, I will level with all of you. I do not know what to think about 9-11. I've read a hundred different analyses on it that all come to different conclusions. I don't have a firm opinion on that one way or the other. And it doesn't matter because that's not what we're about. And so it's important that we don't, um, you know, that when that we talk about what we're really about and not what we're not about, because I see a lot of people that I know that I've met through Z Day or who have, you know, sent me friend requests after Z Day, and I assume that they're at least tangentially related to the um, to the Zeitgeist movement, and they will share something on Facebook, you know, about like I, I don't know lizard people. Um, I know it's 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 weird. Like people, like I got like three hundred friend requests last year, and now sometimes I go on my Facebook and I'm like, why am I reading about the Illuminati? So uh, if you're if you're if you're in the movement, it's important that what you share is um, related directly to the train of thought, and you know if you whatever views you may have. Uh, on these other issues. I'm not trying to tell you you're right or wrong to have them, but try to focus mainly on what our train of thought is because that means that we're getting people who are interested in that train of thought as opposed to somebody who's just, well, you know, I, I want to have like a, I, you know, I feel like there's something wrong with the world and therefore I'm going to blame, you know, the Illuminati or the, the flat earth or, you know what I'm trying to say, right? You also gotta be responsible when you're wearing this T-shirt. Um, you, you, you. Uh, everybody has their idiosyncrasies and passions and and, and personal positions and stuff. So whenever you're you, um, uh, you're involved in a conversation that it's outside the scope of what this really means, which is what it's in Zagas movement defined. If it's not there, then. It's, 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 Take take off your the, the t-shirt. Make make sure that uh, it, it's it's your individual who's talking, and you're not talking about f from the perspective of TZM. And if possible, don't get into that conversation at all. Exactly. Hey Miguel, it's Jason. Hi. So I've had a website up for how to start chapters where I'm from for nine years. And through the, I had, there's a little process to go through. Like, if you're interested, you just found it, you know, what do I do? How do I start a chapter or whatever? You will not find, like, in the, in the six questions I ask, I do, there's no, are you a vegan? That's not in there. Okay. Are you religious? That's not in That's there. That's not in there. Yeah. Did you have a hamburger for lunch? Is not <laughs> in there. And it never has been, and it's never going to be. Because as far as, this is a communication project and impacting values, and what I'm interested in is people who have courage to get up. And, yeah, exactly, exactly. yeah. <clears throat> oh, go ahead and hand PJ the mic on that. So, uh, no, it's good for, for them, they might not be able to hear you in the back, and that was a good comment. I was commenting that this is a project for galvanization. You gotta bring in people with common ground, and there are plenty of people I've met in the movement that are militant vegans. And I think they go out and they really kind of create a false image. And that, I get that. Exactly. And it's unfortunate. But that's, again, it's a grassroots movement. We can't control any of that. Yeah, yeah. So you just, we just try to keep on point. Yeah. That's why I don't talk bad about any kind of religious institution either, because I've met everyone across all religious spectrums that do agree with us. And they might still have that, that theistic belief. Well, so do about half the planet. <laughs> So we're going to have to compromise with that, and we're not an atheist movement either. Even that's another propagandized thing that's been out there. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I guess just one quick point. Uh, for every, was it like 10 people who are trying to 
hack off the branches of uh, capitalism, there's only you know, one actually hacking off the roots. Uh, so I feel like we're at least trying to attack the roots. And uh, some of these other uh, people are just trying to take off the branches, and that's OK. But uh, I feel like uh, th those energies are wasted somewhat. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. Next question. <laughs> Um, my question was just based on um, the concept of where do we stand on ethicality and using a framework to kind of work off on how human beings have to sort of define what goodness is and what um, what is ethical and what is right and how, how do we treat one another. Um, because the focus I know often with the RBE concept is just on the RBE and not I feel like the natural law part was really important in that and making that work because we need to define kind of what the the laws as as whether we want to call them laws or just guidelines that people can follow in order to understand how to um, behave in a, and, and treat each other in a new alternative kind of system I guess my question is um, where do where do we stand on that and what kind of ethical framework would we want to align ourselves with? Would we align ourselves with utilitarianism or deontological principles or the golden mean and by Aristotle or things that have been thought about in, in the philosophical paradigm? Thank you. That's a great question. I would say really the answer is up to you. You know, it's not up to us. We're not really gurus. We're just taking the money out of it and you get the money out of the way and you can behave whatever is appropriate to your society. That's it. Just get the money out of the way. Nothing else really matters after that. So in that sense, is it up to the individual? Yep. Yep. And that individual society. So you're not an island. You know, you're reliant upon your support structure. And if what you're doing is offensive to them, then you'll end up very isolated. But it's up to you. It's not up to us. Yeah. Just. I'd like to add that um, there are values that are consistent with uh, the work we're doing and the future we are creating or the, the socioeconomic model that we are proposing. There are values that are consistent and there are values that are inconsistent. And, and you have to ask yourself, according to what's your understanding of what you, we're trying to do, which values make sense to, uh, um, can, um, can be workable in, in that scenario and which values are not workable. And, and when you begin to identify those values, that you, 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 you create in your mind the value system that is consistent, that is, that is viable. I can't speak for where um, Zeitgeist Movement is at on, on that question. But it seems to me that there's, there's a starting point that, that appears to exist implicitly, and that is the principle of non-imposition, uh, non-domination. And if we start with that, then there's the requirement that we participate in, in dialogue. If we're, if, if we're not to impose on each other, then we need to enter into dialogue. And we need to enter into dialogue with a sense of reasonableness and with um, both an attitude of, of, um, of working with ethical reasoning as well as practicing ethical reasoning. And it comes back to what Habermas talks about as communicative action. And that means a lot more than just talk. Um, it actually means an attitude um, of dialogue where you're coming to it with the intention and commitment to find agreement based on reason. Um, and that doesn't fit easily with the standard ethical categories of utilitarianism and, and deontology and so forth. It's kind of an intersubjective um, category of meta-ethics that is grounded in what, what Habermas calls communicative action. But it really is an attitude of non-imposition non -imposition and, um, and dialogue, which 
unfortunately, the schools are not preparing us to engage in. So it's something, it's in frontier land. It's something that we are going to have to develop competencies in. I once uh, spent a little while trying to trying to um, catalog, uh, uh, and the, the the closest thing that I could find, at least in the Wikipedia, is cybernated uh, or post scarcity uh, left libertarianism. If you if you look in the Wikipedia page, it's sort of it's kind of consistent. But what we're doing is pretty new. It's it's uh, it's it, there. It's not supported by uh, by consisting um, uh, philosophy uh, academic, uh, academically well described. Okay, okay so um, <clears throat> this might work work for you. I know the oops, that can't talk. Okay, I use a combination of deontology and consequentialism when I'm evaluating uh, the rightness or wrongness of given actions. Uh, so to break that down for what people mean, it means it's important to look at two things. It's important to look at what someone was trying to do, and it's also important to look at what they actually did. Uh, so in terms of policy, I tend to be a bit of a consequentialist. So we know, for instance, that um, from Richard Wilkinson's work, that uh, countries with greater degrees of inequality tend to have more crime, more violence, more health problems. So when you look at that and you say, all right, so the, these more right-wing, um, more in unequal countries are having these social problems, and you ask yourself the question, is there an alternative? Well, obviously there is, because even if, even if we didn't know anything about the zeitgeist train of thought, I mean, just like the social democratic model of European countries is at least put, uh, producing slightly better results than, um, than you know, what, what the US and uh, very other countries like that are doing. So um, I tend to feel that in evaluating rightness or wrongness, it's about looking at what is, what is the result of the policy that we're implementing? And if the result is something negative, how can we amend that policy so that it is no longer producing that negative, negative effect? All right, um, okay guys, we've got about 15 minutes left of the panel and I would really like to give the opportunity to the, um, we've got two people standing up for questions. I don't know if anyone else is just being um, yeah, politely just sitting down and waiting. So I would like to suggest to um, the people asking questions if you could direct your question at a particular panelist. Um, and of course, like panelists, you're welcome to answer someone else's question additionally, but I think in the interest of saving a bit of time and allowing more questions, it's a, a better way of doing things. So um, yeah, we'll get a group photo later. We'll sort that out. Okay, Paul, come on down. Next question. Um, it totally changes yeah. my question, um, but if I uh, have one, I suppose it's um, directed at Peter, really. Um, uh, given, I suppose, with uh, the monetary-based system we have and where you know, money's printed out of thin air and we can never pay back the interest, what could or should we be doing about that part of the system which continues to enslave a lot of people? There are other ideas. There's a group called Positive Money out of the UK, and it's it's a it's an interesting suggestion. We have to remember that the market has one. Well, the market structure requires something to be gained in every transaction. We call that profit. And interest in this structure, and it separates it from the physical world. But money being made out of nothing, as opposed to a TV or a car that's being sold for profit, money is sold for profit too. But as you just pointed out, that debt group. The interest is charged, but there is more money, more interest in debt in the system, excuse me, more debt specifically, excuse me, than there is money. And so what you're dealing with is a market phenomenon. You're dealing with a market logic flaw that's been there since the very beginning, which is, of course, through debt peonage has been right up there in parallel with global slavery for about six to 10,000 years at a minimum. So the question is abolition of the entire system when it comes to that, because if you're going to respect or the public the, um, <clears throat> what's the term, <laughs> excuse me, I'm tired. What's the term when uh, you take uh, everything away from industry, you, pro you don't, you nationalize, yeah, so you remove the entire interest and profit basis from banking. Now, if you can, <laughs> if you can do that, if you can nationalize all the banks of the world, wow. Because the banks, unfortunately, in the financial system are more than ever the most powerful institutions on the face of the earth. 
They are the undercurrent of it all. They're the what support the governments and the, the fraud of governments being able to go to war and take endless loans, especially the building of empires, Russia, China, and the US. So to answer your question is I would, if you're gonna really try and work that out, there's, you know, you could talk about things like Bitcoin, there's other solutions that people have talked about with that. But I've thought about the problem, and I think really that it's a better, it's just another great indictment of the entire system and why the whole system should be removed. Thank you. So it's, it's a shovel, um, good or bad. Um, but money is a tool, and the purpose of money is uh, we've we got to understand what um, what is it that money uh, attempts to achieve, and, and that is uh, fairness. Um, and, and does it achieve fairness? So at some point in time, it, uh, it did address that. Um, but now this, this tool is, is highly insufficient. Um, and, and this is the flaws that um, perhaps we should be um, uh, uh, trying to highlight. Uh, that that it just doesn't work for the purpose. So so we need something to um, uh, um, overcome uh, uh, that particular flaw. All right. All right. So first of all, thank you so much, Casey, Zach, everybody from the Brisbane team. You made an event where I wanted to be. You know, you made an event where I wanted to be in two places at once, so many times. So uh, one of the workshops I happened to see at the expense of three others was uh, Richard Michelle's, and I thought it was a really brilliant transition idea that I don't think people, most people here got the summary of. So um, essentially, it's, 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 a, it's a notion where we inherit, like we become stewards of the land and, and people that are you know, original hippies with similar ideas to our own. Um, sort of leave the land to a responsible group who stewarded better than what normally happens. Anyway, I would like him to summarize it for the crowd in as brief a period as he can. And that's it. That's the question. OK, absolutely. I guess this one's for you then, Richard. <laughs> oh, that's quite an ask. Um, I guess what I'm putting forward is a strategy of attracting large amounts of land and property from people of my age, um, ex-hippies, <laughs> people who were once considered the love generation, who are now reaching their 60s and 70s and have acquired huge amounts of property, um, who have to give it away. You know, there's a great big free lunch about to be given away over the next 10 years. And the only options that they have at the moment to give it to their kids, or maybe their friends, or we give it to charity and all. So those are the options they have at the moment. What do the kids usually do with the house and the farm and so forth? What do they usually do with it? They usually sell it to the highest bidder and get a windfall profit. What do the charities do with it? Likewise, they usually don't want to have to use the particular properties. They're not particularly useful properties. They might rent it, um, or they might put it on the market again to the highest bidder. And again, what we have is land and buildings being bought and sold, paid for, freed and then put back into the market so people have to work for it all over again. It's just an insane way of going about things. So what if there was a third option that was attractive to the ex-love generation? What if we cooperated to establish a global property trust Now, why would some of our love generation, why would our baby boomers trust such a trust? You know, a trust 
if it's going to be trusted, has to be trustworthy. And if it's going to be trustworthy, it needs people of integrity, it needs trustees of integrity. And integrity isn't developed overnight, it takes some attitudinal and, and um, it takes quite a, a bit of time to develop the kind of integrity that we need. So we need a, an integrity developing education system that has various aspects to it. And I won't go through the whole spiel here, but there's, you know, the development of a, such an education system starts with what I began to talk about before. Um, it starts with um, people taking responsibility for, first of all, the system that they're consenting to, but also for the values, for the, for the ethics that they live out every day. And the kind of um, governing meta-ethic, if you like, that would, um, would govern such an education system is fairly radical and it's based on the golden rule and the categorical imperative. And the golden rule, as, as, as those of you who don't know, it means give unto others as you would like them to give unto you, or the, the negative version, don't give unto others as you'd like them, as you wouldn't like them to give unto you. Now that that rule has been espoused by cultures and religions for centuries, but it hasn't been acted out. In order to act it out, first of all, you have to work out as the first stage what your ethics are. Because you, you, there's, there's no way that you can live out the golden rule until you've actually worked out those ethics and ideally work them out in dialogue with others, preferably with unlike-minded others. And then, and then you've got to make those ethics public. I've got no idea what your ethics are because it's not on your Facebook pages or your, your LinkedIn pages and we've got no idea what everyone's thinking because they don't talk about what their ethics are, let alone make them public. So the kind of education approach that I would see as part of this integrity developing trusteeship is an education that encourages each of us to really take seriously the process of working out what our ethics are and making them public, and thirdly, living them out, preferably in exemplar relationship with, with others. So you know, all of that would have to be part of a, um, an architecture, social architecture that I talked about in the previous talk, and I haven't got the diagrams here to, to show, but I, I hope that kind of wraps it up. So one of the defining factors uh, of the Zeitgeist movement compared to other organisations is that it does focus on the root causes, as your presentation was about. So I wanted to know, by what methodology do you identify what a root cause is and what a symptom is? So it's basically I was trying to get across a, uh, an issue that is context, okay? Uh, when you relate problems as isolated anomalies, when you look at them as separate okay, outcomes like in of themselves, like, okay, someone stole your car, they need to be imprisoned. Um, you know, a politician lied, they need to be punished. Somebody did something wrong, they need to be fined. Okay? When you have build these up in, in, in a social level, you're basically looking at the macro. And <clears throat> uh, rather and I was trying to get people to understand that rather than looking at all of these causes to fight, you're never going to stop fighting. These causes are everywhere and they're, being, and they're coming at you all the time. And to, honestly, to fight and resist and be angry and pissed and, and, and rah, rah, it's draining. It's draining and it, um, honest, for me on a personal level, it has a very negative impact, on, at least on my health, to be in that state all the time. And that's why I started looking at like, you know, what the fuck is going on with all of this and now I see, it's like, no, these are behaviors that are inside of a system. And if I start changing my, my mind, it's like I see the context differently now that they're not 
problems to go fight individually because there's no time for that. I mean, I could spend the rest of my life just fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and to what end, okay? So now I see that there, that there are symptoms. Just like when you're sick, that your body having symptoms, okay? And, and you know, uh, now you have to address where the cause is at a system level. No different than having a cold or, or having, you know, something seriously wrong with your health. And society has something serious, seriously wrong with its health. It's an organism, uh, a social organism, rather than, you know, say, like just your individual, you know, human body. But it's the same thing. So that changes what you do. That has an impact on where you're going to focus your energy, what are you going to spend your time talking to other people about. And um, uh, uh, that's where problems as symptoms is really a contextual change in somebody's mind. It's, 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 it's the first step to getting them to reorganize all of their attention and what they're going to do as an activist. Uh, okay, um, so yesterday I said that, uh, that it was important for us to connect with other forms of activism and make ourselves allies to those people. I really like the way Eleanor put it in her talk. You know, maybe Black Lives Matter is not your is not your primary cause, but when they need you, you go down there and you help. Maybe Standing Rock is not your primary cause, but when they need you, you go down there and you help to the best of your ability. Um, and the reason I, th but so I kind of think there's a flip side to this too which is that I often wish that when I interact with people uh, from a social justice lens, that I could get them to ask the question, do you think you could, look, so if it's somebody who's like arguing against racism and white supremacy, the, uh, the question I wish they would consider, and it's hard sometimes for me to get, you know, to voice it because I don't want to be the white guy who kind of starts telling them how to fight their fight, but, the question I do wish that they would consider sometimes is, do you think it is possible to eliminate racism while we are in a caustic, uh, antisocial, hyper-competitive system like capitalism? Because I'm, I'm not saying I'm an expert on this particular matter, but from my part, the answer is no. Because as long as we remain in that competitive, uh, anti-social mentality, there's always going to be systems of dominance, and the problem with the system of dominance is that it breeds the idea of dominance, which is then applied into other things. So economic dominance through, through wealth breeds the idea of maybe I can be dominant in some other way, and then, you know, that's where I think that, I don't think those are the root causes of racism and sexism, but I certainly believe it's like throwing gasoline on the fire. So one thing that I think is important to consider is when possible, I think we should ask people who are fighting other fights uh, to, you know, if there's anything from the train of thought that maybe makes sense to them uh, and, um, from the train of thought that we have explained here today. There is a very simple mechanism that can assist in finding the root cause of anything uh, called the 10 whys. It's very simple. You just uh, ask yourself, why is this happening? And then you answer yourself uh, to the best of your ability. And then, but why this thing? Other? And, and, and you dig deeper and deeper. You do it 10 times, and you're most likely going to get to the root cause. It's not always 10 times. You just keep going until you find the root cause. But yes, it's the, the Toyota uh, model. Yeah. Does anyone watch Louis C.K.? I was I was thinking about uh, <laughs> that joke that he's yeah with, with uh, his daughter that keeps on asking why and and gets right down to to the end where he just says because some things are and some things aren't <laughs> and not everything that isn't can't be <laughs> and he's trying to explain <laughs> so I guess we could go down to that level but probably it's not really necessary <laughs> um, all right guys it is reaching the end of our Z-Day experience. Yes, I see that there is one more person for a question. Miguel, I've, it's got good. So, um, so I'll invite, are you okay? No, 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 let's go on. We'll have, we'll have this last question. Um, if you could direct it at, yeah, sure. All right. 
these guys. Yeah, sorry, second question, but it's, it was burning on me before. And, um, so this is about the creative process, and I guess it's uh, directed at Eleanor and Peter, mostly, but obviously for everyone. Um, yesterday there was a really cool lecture by the music guys, the band guys, um, which was awesome. Oh, Dead Letter Circus, Kim yeah. Benzie and Luke Williams. Which was really, really cool and, and um, made a lot of sense to me. Um, and he was, he was talking about, or they were talking about their creative process and how they're kind of like just the muse and they get into the creative zone and then they let the ideas come out and then they sort of capture them. So I was just wondering maybe if you could expand on your creative process, it'd be really cool to find out a bit more about that. Um, if there is anything else or you know, anything to enlighten us or to help us uh, with that creative process stuff would be really cool too. Thanks. I guess, are you asking because you'd like to try and emulate? Or are you Sorry, asking uh, yeah, just... Yeah, I'm, I'm a musician. I create okay. music and, and art as well. So, just, you know, it'd be cool to get some insight from you guys. If you guys have a creative process, getting up at five in the morning or jumping around <laughs> with symbols or whatever you will do, you know, yeah, if there's anything like that, that'd be cool to find out too. I mean, there was a book that was written by a guy who tried uh, the habits of geniuses across history. So, like, everybody from Isaac Newton to uh, Albert Einstein to Kierkegaard. And, I mean, there were some that was, like, ridiculous, the martini at 2 p.m. every day. Um, but what all a lot of them had in common was a walk in the afternoon. Um, and I know that, like, as artists, we always want, like, oh, what, what's something that I can do to get better? But I think that the important thing is that as artists, you're always going to want to know that because you will always be your own worst critic and you'll always want to know how you can get uh, better and more deep, and particularly if you're a political artist, because you're trying to, like I mentioned, like art has this beautiful way of appealing to people's emotion, but in so doing, you have to, you have to present it in music where there's you know, a finite number of uh, measures or a finite tempo or something, or in art, it has to, it has to be in like a, you know, it has to be in that however many, in, not inches, sorry, centimeters or meter, whatever. Uh, I metric system's way better. But, um, I mean, you have to, it has to be in that little space that you have available to you. But I think the most important thing that I always find is, is important is to continue to be inspired, but not just be inspired by political philosophy or by economic philosophy, to be inspired by something that doesn't have a direct connection to what it is that you're doing. So even if that's being inspired by you know, Nietzsche or being inspired by uh, walking around a garden or a, a museum, street art is profound in so many ways. And again, I mean, I'm lucky to be able to interact with a lot of different activists, but I think just getting ideas from people, maybe you'll just find like one little phrase that somebody says and you're like, holy shit, that's a chorus, or something like that. But I think that uh, opening yourself up to be inspired is something that is really important. And then finally, it, the idea of thinking outside the confines of a commodified system. You know, even just the idea, like, as a, when I do creative activism trainings, what I really hammer home is like an umbrella is not an umbrella. You know, like, that this is not a pipe idea. Uh, it can be used creatively in an action. And the same thing goes for your creative process. Like, think outside the confines of what you've been programmed as a child of the empire and a child of the capitalist system. I wish I could sound as eloquent as that. Uh, all I would suggest is there's a tendency in this, well, first, yeah, I'll suggest there's a tendency in society to want to to change your behavior and creative interests or whatever development it is. It could even be programming or even just design in general to favor the interests of others. In the business world, people gravitate, as you said, the commodification. People gravitate just things, things that will find public appeal. And I say that is the absolute opposite of everything that your intent should be, and you have to trust yourself. And that's a very hard thing to do when you have people that are judging all the time, especially if you gain any kind of notoriety. So you always have to fall back to that. As far as the process, I always envy people that find that process to be pleasant or rewarding in the moment. But for me, if you're interested in my creative process, it's just painful. It's just a grueling process of trying to make decisions and culminate stuff, whether it's writing something or doing production work. And I've already expected that drudgery, but it's a rewarding drudgery in the end. It's a, it's a complex Buddhist suffering <laughs> that gets to the end of everything that I've ever produced. And I, you know, for better or for worse, that's just the way it happens to be. 
I think I'm gonna, we're going to end on that note. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I can see Rich really wants to say something, no, so I'll give you, I'll give you a quick... Oh, hold, hold the mic up to your mouth. <laughs> yeah. Okay, real quick. Um, I listen to music, uh, often in the car. An idea for a, a scene will occur to me. I will write that down as soon as possible. Uh, then I will build a story around that. And uh, so usually I start with the climax of any book and then write everything up to that point. Um, the most important advice I can give you as an artist is kind of an echo of what Peter said, is trust yourself. There is no universal method to be an artist. You can't, like, you can't just do as I do and then think that that's going to work because your brain is wired differently than mine. Um, and on top of that, uh, understand that whatever you create, you're going to be looking at it and you're going to see only the flaws. So there's always this sort of tendency to sort of take what you create and just kind of hide it somewhere so that nobody has to be subjected to it. But in reality, other people who read or listen or watch it, um, you know, they, they enjoy it. So uh, allow yourself to, like, find the confidence to, to put that out for people to experience in whatever medium it happens to be, because chances are it's a lot better than you think it is. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, um, I think this reaches the end of our panel. I think this was a really nice uh, finish. And thank you for everyone who came up and asked questions and, and participated in this with the panelists who I think are fairly exhausted. <laughs> As in every single one of them, I kind of know what you've kind of been through vaguely, and I'm fairly sure every single person here is, you know, ready to kind of chill out <laughs> and relax for the evening. So um, I'd like to welcome you to, uh, sorry, invite you to thank our amazing panelists here today. <laughs> okay, and I'd also like to uh, Thank the people that are in the background that you don't see. So you've got people like Paul sitting over there. He's been working on the live stream the whole time, the whole couple of days. Paul also gave us his, his amazing venue on Friday night for the pre-Z Day party. And that, he just did that like just to be nice. It was all like at no cost and we could just bring our own drinks and food along. And he's been like super chilled and helpful with that. So yeah, awesome. <laughs> Also, like to thank our techie at the back, Matt, who's um, been helping us out. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Once again, I'd also like to, to thank Paul, the venue owner, who also gave up this spot for free. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, and uh, God, I don't want to forget anybody, and I know I'm going to do it, but anyway, yes, I'm getting there. Okay, yes, and once again, I'd really like to thank. Vicky for leading the food team. That was incredible. That was a lot of work. <laughs> All the guys who cleaned the venue, to Nat, to James, uh, the people that were on the merch area. And of course, we cannot forget JV and Vince, who come, where are they? Up there? Okay. Now these guys, if you don't know, go to every Z Day Global. <laughs> every main event so th so they travel they take time off their work to come and help and and they don't come here to watch the presentations necessarily they come here to work on the door and basically do whatever we need done and it is has been incredible help and taken off so much pressure for me and the rest of the team so yeah man like JV and Vince amazing work guys <laughs> All right, and you know, for the for the people who've been in the audience, of course, um, you might think that you're just like passively watching or something like that. But you know, we very briefly said it before. I think <laughs> I think we said it kind of aggressively, Eleanor. <laughs> but but I think it was I like it was how we needed to say it. That you know, w we need an audience. 
we need that as well. So for you being here and participating, even just watching and taking in these ideas and then sharing them with people later, you you are being part of the change we want to see too. Even if even if you feel as though you know um, it'd be great if you could contribute to a panel or something like that, just by being here, like I tried to say at the beginning, you're being part of that change we want to see. So thank you to our audience for being here as well. All right, and uh, with that, have I forgotten anyone? Yes, have forgotten? yes, okay, you good. have forgotten someone, Casey. Yeah, um, <clears throat> not only Caroline, but I'm sure everybody here really wants to make sure that the people who worked hardest on this are appreciated. And that would be Zach, if you could come <laughs> up. <laughs> <laughs> these, these guys have worked for six months and really very hard in the last month especially. So let's please give Casey, most of all, a big round of applause. event. I, I couldn't have expected something like this to happen here in Brisbane and to have all of these incredible people here. And yeah, and and Peter, thank you for coming along. <laughs> hey man, I know you I know you don't like the thanks, but uh, you didn't do anything. I think that's so funny. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you started this whole thing, and um, and you know everyone here really appreciates that. I know you're very modest and. And um, I, I appreciate that too. I think that's that's exactly the, the kind of attitude that we need is that modesty and not expecting any uh, any personal thanks, right? We're doing this for the for the train of thought. We're doing this for the movement, and it's it's not that's right. And it's not to to for our own ego. It's it's for everyone else and making the world we want to see. So you do deserve thanks, people. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so Zach did get thanks as well. Zach's my amazing partner as well and who's helped me very emotionally through this whole thing as well. So I have to give him thanks too. Thank you. Yeah, in a minute. Um, okay, uh, so were you thinking... Uh, just off the mic for a second. Hello? Okay, yeah, yeah. So we have, uh, I think, a very, uh, okay, this is going to take a lot of organization. <laughs> um, no, uh, I, I just need it for a moment, sorry. Mic hog. Um, <laughs> um, we will take a group photo out the front of the building, and we'll probably have someone on the other side of the street hold it up. Uh, sorry, uh, just take the photo. And maybe, I don't know if we'll get someone to hold a sign. I guess there's enough TZM shirts going around, which look awesome, by the way. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, yeah, and get someone to take a photo there. But I'm wondering if the first thing we should do, we have lots of hands and helpers here. And we have lots of things that need to be done to get out of this venue as well. So um, if you can lend a helping hand somewhere, that would be great. Just ask any of the volunteers. Um, posters on walls need to be taken off. <laughs> you know, crap like that. Oh, it's already done. Ah, oh, well, forget it. Don't worry. OK. <laughs> OK, well, um, if that's all right then, I guess we'll do the photo thing. All right. Now, Michael, would you like to direct the photo thing? I'll let you do that. OK. Uh, hope you all had an amazing Z Day, everybody, and uh, thank you. Bye. <laughs>
One second. So, I'd just like to say thank you to Jason Lord, who's come here from the US and has done an amazing lot of work with the tech. Would not be, could not be possible without you. Thank you. And thank you, Ziggy. My pleasure.